August 18, 1942. On ships in ports along the south coast of England, 6,000 soldiers have just been given the word. They are to be the lightning force in a raid against the French port of Dieppe. As they make final preparations for the journey, some get a foreboding visit from the man in charge of the operation, Lord Louis Mountbatten. He came aboard our landing craft and gave us a chat. Some of you are going to die today, die like brave men. And got on his speedboat and zoomed off to the horizon, to his mothership. 5,000 of the 6,000 men sailing for France are Canadians. It will be their baptism by fire. They are supposed to hit the beaches just before daybreak and surprise the Germans. But there are problems. We were late in landing. The element of surprise was completely gone and uh, they threw everything at us except the barrels out of their weapons. Well, it was pretty horrendous to see and, uh, you know, it really turned your gut. But uh, there's not a hell of a lot you could do about it. It, it happened. It was a fait accompli. In less than eight hours, Canada counts nearly 3,000 casualties, including 1,900 who are marched off to German prisoner of war camps for 30 months of hell. For the Canadians anxious to make their mark, the ill-conceived plan was a bitter betrayal, and questions about responsibility remain unanswered. When war breaks out in Europe, there is a steady stream of Canadians volunteering for service. Boarding ships for Europe, their spirits are high. They are hoping to make a contribution. And by 1940, they form the backbone of Britain's defense against the threat of a German invasion. They are a familiar feature in the English landscape, but their tasks are far removed from military necessity. They are the only army in the Commonwealth whose soldiers are not involved in fighting the enemy on land. Jack Bennett has been in England with the Signal Corps since 1940. Well, part of it was, was the training, part of it was boring, and part of it was, uh, was we had fun. You know, we're young guys, eh? 19 years old, and uh, that's all right. You try and go out with some girls and go to the show, and, and that's what it was like. Tom McQuaid arrives in England with the 2nd Division in 1941. The, the Canadians were champing at the bit to go into action. They had been for some period of time. And uh, I, I was no different to the rest of them. I was anxious to get into some kind of action. It was, it was getting tedious, this constant training, not uh, being able to utilize it. The men are fed up with training, which seems to serve no purpose, and morale is at an all-time low. There was growing pressure from public, from senior officers, and I believe from soldiers, ordinary private Joneses, to get into action. The great record the Canadians had made in the First World War hung over the, the Canadian Army in the Second War as a, a kind of a, a shadow. In February 1942, General Harry Crerer, one of the senior Canadian commanders in England, complains in a letter to General Bernard Montgomery, commanding officer of Southeastern Command, that the continued lack of active participation in operations provides neither pride nor pleasure to the officers and other ranks of the Canadian Army. He lobbies hard for his troops to be used on operations against the enemy at the first possible opportunity. It won't be long before they get their chance. Uh, 
Spring 1942. While the Canadians languish in England, German soldiers march through Europe, leaving a wake of misery and destruction. In the last two and a half years, the German war machine has steamrolled through Poland and northwestern Europe. Now it's the Soviets who are under attack. They face the enemy alone. They are desperate for help from the Allies. There was a sense on the part of the Soviet leadership that the Western Allies weren't doing very much. Uh, that, I think, uh, impelled Churchill in particular to be uh, aggressive in, in seeking raids that uh, could take some pressure, they hoped, off the Soviets by forcing the, the Germans to deploy troops, more troops, into France, into the uh, occupied Western European countries. Churchill is under pressure to do something, and do it quickly. Soviet leader Joseph Stalin has even made veiled threats. He'll sign a separate peace with Hitler if he has to, to save what's left of the USSR. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor has brought America into the war, and they are pressing for quick action too. Now, together with our allies, we shall concentrate devastating power against this treacherous enemy and rid the world permanently of this menace of barbarism. We made the choice, hold in the Pacific, attacking Europe. The Americans want to launch an invasion of German-occupied Western Europe at the earliest possible opportunity, preferably by the end of 1942. I think the Americans clearly didn't understand what was involved, clearly had no idea of the, the difficulties that would be required to stage a cross-channel invasion against a defended shore. If a cross-channel invasion is impossible, the Americans favor repeated commando-type operations all along the coast to harass the enemy and to provide experience for Allied troops. The British chiefs of staff agree they want a cross-channel invasion, but disagree about the timing. They favor a more roundabout way via North Africa until the Allies have the men and material needed for the final assault against Germany. Churchill thinks that the Allies will have to take a port for any invasion of the continent to succeed. The Allies are well aware that the Germans are building up their defenses all along the coast from the North Sea to the Spanish border. We wanted to see, the theory goes, or the argument goes, if we could take a defended port from the sea. Obviously, if you can take a port, uh, it gives you an advantage in getting supplies ashore quickly after the assault goes in. But the Allies have no experience in mass landings from the sea. For the last six months, Lord Louis Mountbatten, the King's cousin, has been at the helm of combined operations. Under his command, there have been several small raids in France and Norway, with varying degrees of success. As discussions are going on between British and American officials, planners at combined operations are drawing up a list of potential targets. On the list of possible future targets is German-occupied Dieppe, a small port in Upper Normandy frequented by British tourists before the war. It is within a few hours sailing from ports in the south of England and within striking distance by fighter planes. Pierre Lesieux was a young Parisian surgeon working in Dieppe during the war when the Germans had control of the town. One must not forget that at the time, the Germans were preparing the invasion of England, and that Dieppe was one of the ports from which it was to be launched. The invasion was stopped because the RAF maintained control of the air over the channel. At combined operations, Mountbatten and his team decide Dieppe will be the next target for a small commando raid using about 500 men. The plan is to cripple the military installations, radar station and port, and rail facilities. But one of the planners, Captain John Hughes Hallett, fears that the Soviets won't be satisfied with raids involving only a few hundred men. 
The British cabinet favors a large-scale operation too, but combined operations is only set up to do small commando raids, and they don't have the manpower. But there are thousands of Canadian troops in England, ready, willing, and able. I think it was initially intended that this was not to be a Canadian exercise. But when uh, primarily Harry Crerar, General Harry Crerar, who is a corps commander at this point, uh, heard from his close friend, the chief of the Imperial General Staff, uh, Alan Brooke, that there was going to be a raid, he virtually demanded that it be the Canadians who do it. For Harry Crerar, the choice of the Canadians to lead the raid on Dieppe is a vote of confidence and a boost to the morale of the troops. In mid-May, the British Chiefs of Staff approved the plan for the Dieppe raid. The senior Canadian officer in England, General Andrew McNaughton, likes it. Ottawa approves the use of Canadian troops. 6,000 men will be involved, 5,000 from the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division under Major General John Hamilton Roberts. Lieutenant General Bernard Montgomery, commander of Southeastern Command, takes charge of the military preparations. His plan is for a frontal assault against the town of Dieppe itself, with attacks on the flanks at Puy and Pourville, and an airborne drop a short distance inland. A preliminary aerial bombardment will soften up the enemy defenses, and for the first time, tanks will be used in an assault from the sea. Mountbatten takes the plan to the Chiefs of Staff, and a week later the plan is approved. The 2nd Canadian Infantry Division arrives on the Isle of Wight for commando training. Only a few senior officers know that they will soon be taking part in a raid. And the training started out in the morning. You would go down and have PT. You would strip off and have to go in the English Channel. And you couldn't get out until your hair was wet. And that used to be bad. It was cold. And then after that, you'd be back, have breakfast on parade, and then you would do practice landings, or you might go on the, the uh, assault course. A rehearsal for the raid on Dieppe is held on the coast of Dorset, where the pebble-strewn beach is supposed to be similar to the one at Dieppe. It's a fiasco. We left the Isle of Wight, and we were supposed to go to a town called Bridport in Dorset and do a simulated attack on, on the town. Well, most of the troops never got there. Uh, all of the 6th Brigade got lost, and I believe uh, the RHLI, we landed on the beach where we were supposed to be, but we were about two hours late, and uh, it was a complete disaster. A second rehearsal is more successful, and the raid is now scheduled for July 4th. More people are let in on the plan, but the target is still supposed to be a secret. The attack was described, uh, and somebody said, oh, that's Dieppe. And the divisional commander practically had a fit because it was all very secret, and nobody up to that point had any idea that we were even going on a raid. Um, so he did his best to hush it up, but uh, it very quickly got around and everybody knew it was Dieppe. At a last-minute meeting on June 30th, Churchill asks Mountbatten if he can guarantee success. No such assurance can be given, but it's too late to turn back now. On July 2nd and 3rd, as the men board their ships, they assume they're headed on another practice run. But as the equipment is loaded, they are shown photos and maps of their objectives and learn that this time they will face the enemy. Ron Beal joined the Royal Regiment of Canada when war broke out. When they told us on the ships that we were going to raid the port of Dieppe, we were, everybody was, well, you, they were just cheering their heads off. Was, everybody was in high glee. At last, we're going to get a chance to whack these guys. But there will be no raid. Not now. Bad weather and a surprise German aerial raid on the troop ships forced the cancellation of Operation Rutter. 
and General Montgomery is relieved. He learns that a German Panzer division has recently arrived in Amiens, a hundred kilometers from Dieppe, and he recommends abandoning the raid for good. It's just too risky. The troops head back to England, dejected. There was a bit of a, a letdown you know, when the, when the uh, raid was canceled because we all felt we were well-trained and uh, uh, well-prepared to carry out the tasks that uh, were given us. We were sent on leave and we were told not to discuss why we were at the Isle of Wight or taking training in Isle of Wight and what we'd been doing for the last three months and especially not to mention the fact that we were prepared to raid the port of Dieppe. But it's a hard secret to keep. Everybody went on leave, and they got into the pubs, and everybody got drinking and talking about uh, the Isle of Wight training and where we were going to go and so on. Thinking all plans are off, the men begin settling into their barracks, but their superiors are already at work on a new plan. There is mounting pressure to open a second front, and Mountbatten, Hughes, Hallett, and Roberts are well aware of it when they meet on July the 8th. At the meeting, Hughes Hallett makes the seemingly rash suggestion that they simply remount the raid on Dieppe, despite Montgomery's earlier concerns. He is out of the picture now, having been reassigned to North Africa. The best argument for remounting the raid is that no one would believe that anyone would be so foolish as to remount the same raid. So in a sense, you were banking on the fact, uh, I expect, that having once canceled the raid, no one would expect you to, to remount it again. The Canadians are already trained for the operation, and there is no time for planning a new raid against another target. The plan is submitted to the chiefs of staff, who give their approval a few days later. But Operation Jubilee, as the raid is now called, is far from a sure thing. The Royal Navy doesn't want to endanger its capital ships in the English Channel, and Bomber Command fears the fighter arm of the German Air Force on the coast of France. And they have doubts about the man in charge. And I can understand the, the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force taking a rather uh, cautious view of this. The simple truth is, as well, that none of them had any regard for Dickie Mountbatten and all of his schemes, and they looked on them as, uh, you know, game playing by by a you know uh, a senior officer with political and royal connections. In mid-August 1942, Winston Churchill flies to Moscow to meet with Stalin and reassures the Soviet leader that the Allies are not sitting idly by. Something will happen soon very soon. The objectives for Operation Jubilee remain basically the same as for Rutter, with a few changes. The airborne drop is replaced by a seaborne commando assault on both flanks of the landing areas. The men are transported to ports on the south coast of England for what most believe, again, is another exercise. They soon learn that their destination is once again Dieppe. And uh, you look at Jubilee maps, the ones that you just left a month ago, uh, it sort of upset everybody that we were going back to do the same raid, the same place that we were going to do a month earlier. When they told us the second time round that Dieppe was the target and that, that there wouldn't be a power drop, there wouldn't be any bombardment, and we had the element of surprise, there was no cheering, you could have heard a pin drop. It is a perfect night for sailing, but the men are apprehensive. Mountbatten, too, is worried. Without the full support of the Navy and Bomber Command, he knows the operation is vulnerable. And there is still one crucial question unanswered. Do the Germans know the raid is on? The seas are calm on the night of August 18th as the armada of 250 ships carrying 6,000 men sails towards the coast of France. The soldiers are busy readying the equipment which has just come out of the armories. We're doing this at night in the dark 
And one very uh, unfortunate thing that happened was uh, there was a company of Black Watch who were attached to the Royal Regiment to go to Dieppe. And uh, one of the uh, Black Watch men were priming a grenade and dropped it and exploded and wounded 18 men and killed, I think, a couple. Going over, they were telling us that everything was the same as before, except there were more machine gun nests here and more machine gun nests there. And I was given a brand new type wireless set that I'd never seen before, and I had to learn it on the way to Dieppe. I had to learn how to operate it. The calm of the night is broken when a German convoy on its way to Dieppe spots the ships. German sentries on shore at Berneval are alerted by the firing at sea. But luckily, no alarm is raised elsewhere. The British commando units are the first to land, and all goes well. On the extreme right flank, near Varangeville, under cover of darkness, the raiders are undetected by German sentries and make their way inland, where they strike decisively, destroying German coastal batteries. But on the other side of Dieppe, on the extreme left flank, another British commando unit is in trouble. The alert from the firing at sea means the Germans are ready for them, and all they can do is harass the enemy until it is time for them to be evacuated. Now it's time for the Canadians. The South Saskatchewan Regiment are the first to reach shore at Pourville. When we went in, it was dark, just cracking dawn. And uh, actually, I was on the beach before the first shots were fired uh, out. Uh, and uh, we uh, uh, went over the seawall. We had scale and ladders and went over the seawall. Most of the regiment makes it ashore safely and clears part of the village. But the unit has been landed on the wrong side of the Sea River. It will have to cross a small bridge in order to hit the radar station and attack the town from behind. The commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Cecil Merritt, personally leads the assault under murderous German machine gun and mortar fire. He went on and tried to get the guys across the bridge. And then we marched across that bridge afterwards, and I would say there wasn't a square foot of it that didn't have a pit in it from a mortar bomb. It just just, they had it ranged right out, and uh, I don't know how the man, I know he got wounded there, but I don't know how the man wasn't killed completely, you know, very quickly. The fighting is raging when the Cameron Highlanders of Canada land on the beach at Poorville. Their task is to head inland and raid the airfield located five kilometers from shore before attacking the German divisional headquarters believed to be in Arc Le Bataille, three kilometers beyond. The Camerons make their way through the woods to Petit Apville, halfway to the airfield before being forced to retreat. Nearly half of the two regiments landed at Pourville cannot be evacuated from the beach. I know. I went out and I dumped my wireless set in the channel and I swam out and the last boat that came in, I was about 15 feet short of it and the doggone thing turned around and went out and I had to swim back. And uh, out in the water it was murder. Many of the troops are not yet ashore when the BBC broadcasts a warning to the citizens of the Dieppe area. This is only a raid. Do not endanger your lives by helping the Allies coming ashore. Puy, to the west of Dieppe, is the objective of the Royal Regiment of Canada and a company of the Black Watch. High cliffs surround the landing area and a narrow gap leads inland. The Royal Regiment is late and lands in broad daylight. We were told that we would have the element of surprise. And we still believe that that was so until we got within a certain distance of the beach and we started receiving horrendous machine gun and small arms fire and uh, artillery fire. Some of that artillery fire was very accurate. Some of our landing craft were blown out of the water. Well, I got my feet blown out from under me part way up the beach. 
It was a matter then of crawl, shots firing around you and crawling up, hoping that you'd get missed. We were outflanked and we were in total enfilade of fire. There was absolutely nothing that we could do. The Navy couldn't get in to take us off. We couldn't advance. We couldn't retire. We just had to take it. And we tried to give back as good as we got. More than 200 men lay dead on the beach at Puy. The main frontal assault against the town of Dieppe goes in after daybreak. As the first landing craft near shore, there is not much opposition. The Germans are confused by the smoke screen laid down by Allied aircraft. The Royal Hamilton Light Infantry in the Essex Scottish, accompanied by tanks and engineers, give the initial assault. If they are successful, the Fusilier Mont Royal will be sent in to exploit the breakthrough. I was astounded because I could see that all of the buildings along the shore were in perfect condition. And we were given to understand that the, the uh, RAF were going to bomb the town and knock everything down. And uh, obviously, uh, nothing much had happened. The tanks come ashore with the engineers, but only seven of the 28 landed make it over the seawall. The others quickly become bogged down in the shale, which is nothing like the beach which they practiced on in England. Because the stones, the hard flint stones, were baseball size, the tracks picked up. And unfortunately, half of the tanks that landed lost a track, which happened to ours. The shale on the beach isn't the only obstacle facing the tanks. The Germans have set up tank barriers, which bar the way into the town. It was extremely difficult to weave your way through, and uh, even with a great deal of help from the engineers, I think we would have still had trouble with the streets because there were narrow little streets, and each one had a tank trap in it. Engineers carrying packs of explosives are supposed to blow holes in the German defenses and attack port and rail facilities, but most of them do not make it off the beach. Finally, I, I guess I'd thrown the pack off my back when I realized that uh, there was no way I was going to go, and I saw a uh, sapper beset. Uh, he was on the barbed wire, and he was being burned to a crisp. So I, I realized there was no point in me hanging on to 75 pounds of explosive, so I threw it off, and I guess I just uh, uh, lay down on the beach and tried to get some cover. Only a few small bands of men landed on the main beach, fight their way into the town. After a close engagement with the enemy in the casino, Captain Dennis Whitaker leads his men a few hundred meters into Dieppe before coming under intense fire. I crouched behind the wall, and a machine gun from someplace, I don't know where, fired at me, and the bullets went and hit the wall in front of my head and under my stomach. And I was very lucky I wasn't hit, I wasn't touched. Back on the destroyer Calpe, General Roberts, the force commander, and Captain Hughes Hallett, the naval commander, are receiving confusing information from shore. Radio communications are often garbled. A message saying some Essex Scottish have penetrated into the town is understood as if the whole regiment had made headway. Sensing success, General Roberts commits his reserve, the Fusier Mont Royal, to the assault. Before the confusion is cleared up, the unit is already under murderous German fire on the beach. Shortly after 10 a.m., Roberts orders the evacuation from all beaches. There was one landing craft managed to come into the beach, and some of the men made, made it to the landing craft, dragging along some of the, wound, of the wounded, and it got out maybe 25, 50 yards and it took a direct hit, and that was the last we saw of that. When the landing craft came in to take us off, we um, helped what wounded we could, and we made for the, the shore. 
and I fortunately got on a one of the landing craft that came in, and it wasn't hit. The men fighting for their lives have little time to pay attention to what is going on in the skies overhead. It is, in fact, the largest air battle of the Second World War. Hundreds of fighters from both sides are involved in dogfights. It is a terrifying spectacle for the residents of the Dieppe area. Les avions arrivaient en rose the planes came in at rooftop level, machine guns firing and dropping bombs. The sky was lit up by explosions. Tracer bullets laced the fight of filled sky, and once in a while, a plane was shot down. The air battle is no more successful than the seaborne assault. The Allied air forces lose more than 100 aircraft and the German Luftwaffe less than 50. On shore, Canadian soldiers are surrendering by the hundreds. With their backs to the sea and no means of evacuation, they throw themselves at the mercy of the Germans. Finally, one of the officers said, if anybody's got a white towel, please put it up on a bayonet and we're surrendering. We're not going to get wiped out. We're not going to lose any more lives. Uh, eventually at one o'clock in the afternoon the beach surrendered and uh, then the Germans came down checking to see those people who were alive, those who weren't. The beach at Dieppe is strewn with the casualties of war. 807 Canadians are dead, hundreds more are wounded and 195 other Allied servicemen lose their lives. 2,200 manage to escape capture by the Germans. Some are still on the landing crafts. Others are able to make it back. But for more than 1,900 Canadians taken prisoner, a long march towards a brutally grim existence as prisoners of war begins. Bandaged and beaten, the soldiers captured at Dieppe are given first aid and carried to the local hospital where French medical staff are ordered to separate the wounded into two groups, those well enough to march and those who need medical attention. But the hospital is already overwhelmed with casualties. Uh, so they loaded us into a cattle car, a, cow, um, a freight car. Uh, the car was designed for eight horses or 40 men, and they fit 80 stretchers into it. They made a stop at the graveyard and got rid of those that weren't moving, and they took the remainder of us on to Rouen. There was four of us that uh, survived that boxcar. As the prisoners of war stumble across France on their way towards more than 30 months behind barbed wire, they are met with a show of kindness. The uh, French people came out and started tossing tomatoes. And all the Germans started laughing because they figured the French people were bombarding us with tomatoes. Really what they were doing was throwing the tomatoes to us and we were catching them and eating them. And when the Germans suddenly realized that they were feeding us tomatoes, they then turned on the French people and stopped them from doing that and chased them back into their homes. As the Canadians are being marched to the camps, the German propaganda machine wastes no time pumping out its version of the disaster at Dieppe for the public on the home front. Das sind die Opfer des Amateurstrategen Churchill, der sich von Stalin zu diesem Abenteuer erpressen lassen musste. And in their version for the English-speaking world, the Germans mock the Canadian effort. Those are the Canadians which the London radio described as looking like refreshed giants after the battle. On the beaches, the Germans at first treat the prisoners according to the conventions of war, but that is about to change. A planning document from the raid is found by the Germans, and it includes instructions to tie captured Germans' hands to prevent them from destroying documents. 
The Germans put that plan into action themselves in October at the Lambsdorff prison camp, where the majority of the Canadians are held. They read us a speech, and they told us that we were not soldiers. We were criminals and gangsters, and that we would be treated as criminals and gangsters. And uh, we did not, we were not entitled to and would not receive treatment that soldiers should receive. And they made that come true. They tied our wrists, and to add insult to injuries, the ropes that they tied us with came off Red Cross parcels. We were like that for three months. Men to go to the, out to the latrines, they would take six men with a Red Cross man, and he'd take you out there, and he'd have to undo your pants for you and that, because we didn't have zippers, eh? It was um, pretty grim. After that, we were in chains, about 12, 13 inches apart, cufflinks. They, they, uh, spray up, the, the, the abrasions on the wrist were bad. During the period, we were in chains for 14 months. We found ways and means of getting the chains off. The cans of food that have keys on them, we saved the keys and we could work them to get the, the chains off and we'd put them in our pocket. But if you were caught with your chains off, your hands were chained behind your back and you were taken outside and you were stood nose to toes against the cement wall of the barrack room. And if you moved so that your nose or your toes came away from that wall, you got a rifle butt between your shoulder blades. The chains finally come off when the Canadian government threatens to take reprisals against German prisoners of war in Canada. In January 1945, the Soviets have renewed their offensive and are moving closer to the prison camp at Lambsdorff. The Germans are on the run and they take the prisoners with them, ill-equipped for the long cold march. And our biggest enemy was hunger. Five men to a loaf of bread. And your, your, your portion of that bread would be a slice about an inch and a half thick. And about every 10 days or two weeks, you'd get a, a thin, gruely soup made from either cabbage or potatoes or oats. And that would, hap that would be warm. And you'd get that maybe every 10 or 10 days or two weeks, if you were lucky. Many Canadians do not survive the march. More than 70 men captured at Dieppe die as prisoners of war. May the 8th, 1945. Victory in Europe. By now, all the Canadians have been liberated. For these young men in their 20s, the bloody experiences on the beaches and the months of incarceration take a toll. I found that uh, when I got back, my family, to me, they had cha I felt they had changed. I know I had changed. I wasn't the same person that went away. I was a family clown before I went away. When I come back, I was a very serious man. I had grown up. More than half a century after the fiasco at Dieppe, the raid remains one of the most questionable operations of the Second World War. The image of dead bodies on the beaches of Dieppe can never be erased from the memories of those who were there. By any definition, Operation Jubilee was a human disaster. But it did at least have one positive effect. The day after the carnage, the Germans surveyed the site and immediately ordered more troops to the area. A few weeks later, Hitler transferred 10 crack German divisions from Stalingrad to northwestern Europe. Pressure on Russia was relieved. For the past 50 years, historians have analyzed the Dieppe raid and have come to different conclusions about its military worth. Some have sought to assign blame for the failure. Others have tried to determine responsibility. 
Most have seen in Operation Jubilee a lesson from which the Allies would profit in future landings in North Africa, Sicily, and Normandy. Immediately after the raid, the blame for the fiasco fell on the man who led the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division, Major General John Hamilton Roberts. Somebody had to be made a scapegoat, so he was it. And uh, it was, uh, you know, a very unfair fair to him, I think, because he was a good soldier and had proven himself to be a good one. If you didn't sack Roberts, you'd have to sack Crerar or McNaughton, and those, those people weren't going to be sacked. And so I think it's clear that Roberts, who I think conducted himself as well as anyone could have in the chaos of Dieppe, uh, was simply made to pay the price. He was pushed over the... The, the edge uh, for that. Those at the highest levels were not called to account, and many moved on to higher command. The Chief of Combined Operations, Lord Mountbatten, became Supreme Commander in Southeast Asia. After the war, questions were raised about his responsibility for the disaster. I'm not an admirer of either Mountbatten or Combined Operations headquarters at all. Uh, it seemed to me that this was the, uh, the uh, showman's war. This was war for public relations. This was war so that Dickie Mountbatten would look good. And I don't have huge confidence in their ability to plan anything. Mountbatten, although he was head of c combined operations, didn't have a, heck of a lot to do with the actual planning. Montgomery was one of the big planners. And uh, although Mount Blatt Batten takes all of the blame, uh, I don't think he, w he should, should take it. The man at the top of the chain of command for the Dieppe raid was Lord Louis Mountbatten. And if the buck is supposed to stop at the top, I guess you'd have to say that the man responsible for the raid was Lord Louis Mountbatten. Also in question after the war, why was the intelligence gathering for such a large-scale operation so poor? We didn't know where the Germans were and how many there would be. We didn't know enough about the situation on the ground in terms of terrain. Um, it was incredibly foolish to put people ashore against a defended port. And if you've ever been to Dieppe and you walk on the beach and you look up at the cliffs that surround it, and you realize that that's where the Germans would be, then you realize just how difficult that, that operation, how impossible that operation would be. The Allies did learn from Operation Jubilee. It was the one and only time they tried a frontal attack on a defended port, and as a result of the disaster, Churchill's view that a port was essential for the invasion of the continent was abandoned. Instead, the Allies built a floating harbor and towed it across the English Channel just after D-Day in June 1944. Specialized tanks and other equipment to deal with enemy defenses were also developed following Dieppe, and intelligence gathering became a priority in later operations. Landing parties surveyed the beaches months before any seaborne assault. And for Canadians, the face of war had changed. In 1942, the Canadians that attacked Dieppe were as well-trained as any Canadians. But they were not as well-trained, perhaps, as they were two years later when Dieppe, when uh, D-Day comes around. Um, there were serious changes in the way Canadians were trained uh, and in the way the war was perceived, I think, uh, as something serious by Canadians between 1942 and 44. The men who took part in the raid and those who were captured by the Germans knew that war was a serious affair. For them, the Dieppe raid only has meaning if it led to lives being saved later. But there's been a lot of talk about uh, for every man that was lost on the beaches of Dieppe, 10 men were saved on the, on the uh, D-Day beaches. And when you look at the casualty figures for Dieppe and you look at the casualty figures for D-Day and you compare them against the number of men that were committed to the two operations, uh, yes, their casualties were about 1 to our 10. 
On D-Day, 15,000 Canadian troops landed on Juneau Beach and suffered only a third of the losses that were incurred during Operation Jubilee. The Allies had indeed learned from the disaster at Dieppe. But the history books don't record it that way. In most of them, Dieppe warrants only a few lines. There's many ways that the lessons of Dieppe were applied. The question always comes back to, did we have to learn them? Did we have to learn them at the cost of so many Canadian lives?